Yakimite is another subclass that comes to us in the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount. Uh, this one's for Fighter. The Echonite is a mysterious and feared frontline warrior of the Kryn Dynasty. The Echonite has, has mastered the art of using Dunamis to summon the fading shades of unrealized timelines to aid them in battle. Surrounded by echoes of their own might, they charge into the fray as a cycling swarm of shadows and strikes. Now, you can potentially reflavor this as, let's say, like a spectral knight. Uh, maybe the echo itself is a, uh, an undead or a ghost or, you know, some kind of a specter. Uh, you can stick with this sort of echo as a magical manifestation of the uh, the fighter. I, I think there's ways to make this work to make it a little bit more sending agnostic. Uh, however, this was written for a specific campaign setting, so there you go. My first thoughts. I, uh, this is the second time I'm shooting, the no, second or third time I'm shooting this now. I had audio issues with the first one, and I had originally thought that this was a little on the upper end of balance. Um, I think I might have come to that with the thought of, I like to run flanking at my tables because I just like how, how it, how it speeds up the pacing of combat. I came to it later after talking to some other designers uh, I had messaged Benjamin Huffman just to get his perception on it, and he generally thinks that this this class might be underwhelming, if anything. So I'm giving this another look uh, with some of the things that he had to say, some of the, my own perspective here after having seen it, uh, keeping some other things in mind. So yeah. So the bread and butter third level feature, Manifest Echo. You can use a bonus action to magically manifest an echo of yourself in an unoccupied space that you can see within 25 feet of you. The echo is a magical translucent gray image of you that lasts until it's destroyed, until you dismiss it as a bonus action, until you manifest another echo, or until you're incapacitated. Your echo has an AC of 15 plus your proficiency bonus, so right at the bat this is already getting AC of 16. One hit point and immunity to all conditions. If it has to make a saving throw, it uses your saving throw bonus for the roll. It is the same size as you, and it occupies its space. On your turn, you can mentally command the Echo to move up to 30 feet in any direction, no action required. This next part of this feature can be a little confusing. I know it was for everyone I've asked, and I, I think I have a reason as to why this is confusing, and maybe we can take a lesson from this for making our own homebrew in the future. If your Echo is ever more than 30 feet from you, at the end of your turn, it is destroyed. So this sentence, why is this, why is this so confusing? If your echo is ever, is a flexible point in time, right? If your echo is ever, there's a condition that needs to be met in order for that to trigger. At the end of your turn refers to a static moment in time, right? So game design wise, the end of your turn is a fixed point. If your echo is ever, makes it feel like that fixed point is now a flexible fluid point in time. Ideally, I think the way that this should be written is if your echo is more than 30 feet away from you at the end of your turn, it is destroyed. I think that should be the way that this is written, and honestly, like, this might be worth errata-ing in a future publication. Yeah, I, I just, I hope that that doesn't cause any issues at the table. N little nitpick there, but I think it's a worthy nitpick because it's a little confusingly written. You can use the Echo in the following ways. As a bonus action, you can teleport, magically swapping places with your Echo at the cost of 15 feet of your movement, regardless of the distance between the two of you. When you take the attack action on your turn, any attack you make with that action can originate from your space or the Echo space. You make this choice at for each attack. Uh, when a creature that you can see within 5 feet of your Echo moves at least 5 feet away from it, you can use your reaction to make an opportunity attack against that creature as if you were in the echo space. Okay, I want to talk about this first part of it. So you use your bonus action, you can teleport, so this is the condition you have used your bonus action on your next turn now, so you can't do it the turn that you do it. On your next turn, you can magically teleport and swap places with this thing at the cost of 15 feet of your movement, regardless of the distance between you two. So you can send this thing further out, it uses, let, let's just say, 30 feet of its movement, you swap places with it now, cost 15 feet of your movement, you have the ability to move another 15 feet away, so you get 45 feet, if not more, movement out of this, 
So let's just say this. Let's say it's 30 feet away from you at the end of your turn. It doesn't get attacked. Your turn comes up. You send the Echo out another 30 feet. It's now 60 feet away. You can, bam, teleport to it. You can move. In, you can now move, usually with some races, I would say another 15 feet, if not more, depending on how much of your movement speed you get. For something like the Wood Elf, this may be even more movement. I, I think that the conditions in which that's met, uh, the build or the investment that you're going to have to make in order to get that, I don't think that it's necessarily too strong. It may be abusable, uh, especially if you allow this thing, let me see here, uh, you can mentally command it to move 30 feet in any direction. It can't take, it doesn't sound like it can take the dash action up to 30 feet. So I, yeah, it doesn't sound like it gets its own action necessarily. It's that it only acts in ways that you can command it. So it can't take the dash action. At least the way I'm reading it, that's how it looks. When you take the attack action on your turn, any attack you make with that action can originate from your space or the Echo space. You make this choice for each attack. I feel like that's okay. When a creature that you can see within 5 feet of your Echo moves at least 5 feet away from it, you can use your reaction to make an opportunity attack against that creature as if you were in the Echo space. That's, that's I think, something that really had to get put into it. I don't think that that's that bad. I think that blowing your reaction to use that thing to attack, honestly, there's not many uses of your reaction that you're going to get in your turn, especially as a fighter. I think this is just more ways to use your reaction, which I'm okay with. Me as a DM, I'm kind of hoping that fights end in a, in a good time. You know, I'm trying to keep the, the battles going in a pretty fluid, consistent, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, it's not the DM's goal to make the players lose. This is another way where the fighter gets to use a reaction, I feel like I'm alright with this. I I can't see a real big problem with this feature as is, at least as part of this feature. I think that this needs a little bit of word edits right here. Just another pass by an editor, kind of clearing it up. Yeah, this last sentence right here feels like it could be a little confusing. I think that this is probably the strongest part of this entire feature right here. There may be some builds in which this is just insane, insanely good. You use your bonus action that you can teleport. It's going to take an investment from your previous action in order to set that up. In situations like in dungeon crawls where you're trying to get over some certain obstacles, this could be potentially abusable. However, I don't really think that that's a major, major problem here. You're hoping that your adventurers are prepared to tackle these problems and think of innovative ways in which they use their features and what they have on them in order to overcome obstacles. It might feel creative the first time and then abusable the second, third, fourth, and 200th time that they do this in a campaign. Unleash Incarnation, you can heighten your Echo's Fury. Whenever you take the attack action, you can make one additional melee attack from the Echo's position. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your constitution modifier, minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. I think whenever you know that this is coming up, and this is something that you're planning on building into, you are probably going to prioritize either building a class or investing into your constitution modifier, whether you're doing point by or you're rolling off. And then whenever you get to your ability score improvement, you're probably going to be putting a little bit more in the constitution. However... Whenever you take the attack action, if you're investing more into your constitution, sure, you're getting more attacks, but the attacks may be less effective because you're missing out on investing into your strength. I think that might be a hidden part of how this is balanced out. I originally thought that this was the moment where the Echo Knight gets a little bit too much of the action economy here and starts to outshine other class options. I've heard from other people that they feel that this is actually significantly weak. My problem, I think, for me coming to this is that uh, I run a table with a tweaked version of the variant flanking rules, and I, I heard from Benjamin, right, you shouldn't really be looking at this with variant rules in mind. I completely understand. I think variant rules, as far as in this certain situation, might be something to consider. Unleash Incarnation, if you're using the flanking rule where you're on one side, if you've got a friendly, you've got a friendly, you've got an ally, on the other side of it, uh, you get advantage on the attack roll if that al ally was also engaged with that same target. I run a variant rule where, depending on the size, flanking may or may not come into play. I might get into that in another time. This rule, and with the variant rules for flanking, I think if you use that, I would just be aware this can be abusable. This, this might actually be 
way strong in that situation. Uh, we're just going to go with rules as is. I think rules as is, you know, if you're investing into your constitution, we're talking three attacks that it can make per day as well as you. You use your action surge. It, it feels like it synergizes fairly well with all the stuff that Fighter is doing and is about to do at later levels. However, yeah, it does seem like there's some push and pull as to how the scales are tipped with this one. So, Unleash Incarnation, I personally feel like it's pretty strong, significantly stronger if you're using the variant flanking rules at your table. Echo Avatar, 7th level Echo Knight feature. You can temporarily transfer your consciousness into your Echo. As an action, you can see through your Echo's eyes and hear through its ears. During this time, you are deaf and blinded. A uh, little... Again, this is... I feel like I'm doing a lot of nitpicking here. Usually, conditions, damage types, and other things like that, if you're listing them as different entities or different... Uh, like, I don't want to say nouns, but either qualities or they are items in which you're listing... 5e design convention usually puts them in alphabetical order, so I kept having the hardest time reading this as, during this time, you are blinded and deaf and not deaf and blinded. It sounds so, like, it sounds like such a nitpick. It really is, but yeah, that's just a little minor note there if you're designing some homebrew. It usually reads a lot better whenever you do it that way, too, for whatever reason. Uh, you can sustain this effect for up to 10 minutes, and you can end it at any time, requires no action. While your Echo is being used in this way, it can be up to a thousand feet away from you without being destroyed. So this is one of the cooler scouting and utility features of the Familiar. Um, I feel like if you are doing dungeon crawl heavy campaigns where you as a DM really like traps, um, this is going to really kill your love for making traps because it's going to make your traps feel like they're completely insignificant because all they have to do is summon this avatar, throw this body out there, and suddenly trap wires don't matter, suddenly pressure plates, whatever, they're just going to send the echo on top of everything, blow it all up, and then, like, go through it. You could say as a DM, that means that you need to come up with more clever traps and stuff. You know, you're usually preparing for just your characters being their characters, uh, that's another reason why I think Necromancer is significantly strong in some of these dungeon crawls is because they can just bring these corpses up, send them into all the traps, and then just not have to deal with it, you know. Uh, having control of another body is significant, especially one that you don't give a shit about. So Echo Avatar, I think is good. I think it's something that flushes out the roleplay, sort of uh, utilitarian, utilitarian, I guess utility-focused aspects of this subclass. Uh, I like it. My worries are probably more with the base class and the mechanics of it itself. Shadow Martyr, 10th level Echo Knight feature. You can make your Echo throw itself in front of an attack directed at another creature that you can see. Before an attack roll is made, or before the attack roll is made, sorry, you can use your reaction to teleport the Echo to an unoccupied space within 5 feet of the target creature. The attack roll that triggered the reaction is instead made against your Echo. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Essentially, you using your bonus action beforehand, and it, the conditions are you have your Echo, and you haven't used your reaction. You can do this. What, you, what this really does is you are using your reaction to get rid of another creature's action there. You know, unless they have multi-attack, uh, which most things at this level will have. I think that... Uh, this is fine. Uh, once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. I think the fact that you can only do this once per fight uh, makes up for that. And once you use this feature, you can't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that much of the action economy getting thrown away just because of your reaction. Because there's reactions like shield, and, you know, that's a spell slot. That's a pretty significant resource for a wizard that they only get on a long rest. Once you use this, this is better shield. This is really freaking good. At 10th level, sure, that's kind of negligible. It, it's funny, because now that I think about it in terms of it's almost like an at-will, but not really at-will, free first-level spell, now it feels weak. I, I, like, if I'm comparing it to shield. Oh, this is a tricky one to really figure out how I feel. 
reclaim potential, 15th level Echo Knight feature. You've learned to absorb the fleeting magic of your Echo. When an Echo of yours is destroyed by taking damage, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to 2d6 plus your constitution modifier, provided you don't already have temporary hit points. Let's be realistic here at 15th level, you know that this is coming up. You're probably going to be throwing all your ASIs into your constitution modifier, not only to get more potential out of this, but more potential out of your Unleash Incarnation. 2d6, average roll of 7, so yeah, 3.5, 3.57, plus 5, so you're talking 12 hit points on average, uh, provided you don't already have temporary hit points. You can use this feature a number of times, equal to your constitution modifier, likely 5 at this point, a minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Okay, so on average, this is, uh, so 12 plus 12, plus 12, plus 12, plus 12, so 60. On average, this is going to be 60 temporary hit points that you are getting access to at the cost of your Echo Knight, which you can resummon as a bonus action on your turn. The, the cost of that thing dying. I personally look at it, and I'm like, most campaigns don't get to this level, so it's kind of whatever. 60 temporary hit points, I feel is really good. I feel is that's strong, that's significant. Uh, reclaim potential, I think it's good. I think it's strong. So looking at some of the other fighter options, like Champion is getting superior critical. Now they have a 15% chance to critically hit. I, fantastic. Uh, let's look at Eldritch Knight. What do they get? So they're getting the ability to teleport into 30 feet to an unoccupied space. Use When you use your action surge... Okay, and then uh, let's see here, Battlemaster. Battlemaster is getting, when you roll initiative and you have no superior, superiority dice remaining, you regain one superiority die. Samurai. Starting at 15 level, you learn to trade accuracy for swift strikes. When you take the attack action on your turn, you have advantage on an attack roll. Against one of the targets, you can forego the advantage to make an additional weapon attack against the target. As part of the same action, you can do so no more than once per turn. Uh, so whenever I'm looking at some of the other ones, the Echo Knight's 15th level feature seems pretty freaking strong other than the champion. I think it's probably, it's interesting, it's, it's less, I think this is probably a little bit under the champion, a little bit over, like, Eldritch Knight. Reclaim Potential might be, yeah, I, I think Reclaim Potential might be alright. Uh, Legion of One... You can use a bonus action to create two echoes with your manifest echo feature, and these echoes can coexist. If you try to create a third echo, the previous two echoes are destroyed. Anything you can do from one echo's position can be done from the others instead. In addition, when you roll initiative and have no uses of your Unleash Incarnation feature left, you regain one use of that feature. Unleash Incarnation also gets better here, because you can make one additional melee attack from the echo's position. Can you attack twice now? with your Echo's positions. I'm, I'm not going to assume that you can here. I'm just going to think that that should just be one attack. Uh, Legion of One. Legion of One is one of those things where, like, depending on your variant rule usage, if you use flanking, this is insanely strong. If you don't, then this is kind of like, okay, cool. Uh, you get a little bit more control of the, the battlefield. I, you, can, you have more spots that you can pop in and out to. Uh, is it that the cost of, you use your bonus action, you can teleport, okay, so you don't get another bonus action, so you can't just pop, pop around. Um, what is this really doing for you? I think this is just giving you more area to cover and another echo to get killed for your reclaim potential. It's giving you more area control, which is something that I don't think a lot of people really consider because we just mostly see numbers whenever we're first coming to this game and we think, cool, more damage, I want that. So area of control is extremely strong. It was one of the reasons why Mike Merles admitted that uh, he didn't, he was very reluctant to give Beastmaster Ranger a large size companion. You're controlling a lot of points on the battlefield to provoke opportunity attacks now. You're getting a lot of areas in which you can make up, you can just make attacks now. It's funny, I don't really know overall what where Echo Knight really stands for me. Um, I think it's really dependent on the rules that you have for your table. You know, if you are one of the tables that uses the variant rule for flanking, I would not advise allowing the Echo Knight on, the ta on your table. 
until we really get a better perspective as to how this class really works. Um, I do think that the Echo Knight needs another pass in editing. Uh, hopefully something gets eroded uh, in the next print run for the Explorer's Guide to uh, Wild Mount. So that way some of these things, like if your Echo is at more, ever more than 30 feet from you at the end of your turn, it is destroyed. Um, this is this is one of those things right here where, uh, like I said, uh, as far as the design goes, this is a static point in time and a fluid point in time or a flexible point in time just clashing together in the sentence, and it can cause confusion. On my table, I wouldn't allow the Echo Knight because I do like the variant flanking rule, even though some people have their own opinions about that. I, I think that this would be too strong on my tables. And then if I took away the flanking rule, it immediately seems like the Echo Knight is just kind of like a mm, okay, probably a little bit above the strength of like Eldritch Knight, but still under champion. Um, Echo Knight is most likely, I would say at that point, if I was just doing vanilla rules, probably an A tier class in my of my opinion yeah let me know what you guys think down in the comments below echo knight fighter are you excited to see this thing or is it welcome in your tables what's your opinions of it do i just am i just reading this thing completely wrong <laughs> you know if you're new to this channel i do a lot of DD content here uh, mostly with a focus on game design and breaking down classes trying to you know, teach you guys some things that you might not know about certain classes and give you my opinion on where they stand against the other class options. I also opened up my Patreon to where you can submit your homebrew content. Uh, I can give you my opinions. I've also got a tier where I can actually get Benjamin Huffman and Ross Leiser to come in and also give you their opinions. So if you're a designer and that sounds like something that would interest you, maybe you want to get some advice on how to publish your content on the DMs Guild, go check out my Patreon. Uh, leave a message down in the comments below and I'll try and chat you up. Uh, other than that, do all the YouTube things. Yeah. And I will see you guys in the next one.